Good morning. I want to start with one uh, comment about questions in general. I want this recorded for reasons that you'll see. Um, uh, Professor Beekner suggests to me that there is, uh, are some people who are hesitant to ask questions on the feeling that they will be bad questions and that I will not be uh, responsive or receptive or that they will be laughed at and therefore the safest thing is just not to ask. And there was a couple of times last time where I said, is there any questions and no hands went up, which is always a bad sign. So he asked me to give my standard statement on bad questions, uh, which I would like to do. Uh, lecturers always say there are no bad questions in order to encourage an audience to ask questions. I don't believe that. I think that most questions that people ask are bad. <laughs> But I take a different view. I think you can learn more nine times out of ten from a bad question than from a good question. And I certainly asked Miss Rand more bad questions than good ones. That is, questions that astounded her, made her indignant, baffled her completely, as opposed to the good questions where you say, a question which is right on the context, exactly follows from what she said, and it's obvious so this is the next step, you say that's a good question, it's perfectly logical. If you can get to ask a good question, you don't really need to learn that much more. But when you ask a bad question, that's exactly what indicates that you're out of left field, you're, to switch the metaphor, you're swimming completely, you don't know where you're going, and your question reveals this chaos that everybody has to go through in some form at some point. Uh, and it, it enables a, a lecturer and you yourself to come much quickly, more quickly to an understanding of what your problem is. So a lecturer should welcome bad questions. And I do, and I did say something that I have to apologize for because I did the worst thing, uh, so I wanted this on the tape, uh, an author can do. Somebody asked a perfectly good question, uh, which I had one sentence in my book, which by implication would have answered that if, he had, if I had written the essay that it implied. And I couldn't resist making this terrible statement. You obviously haven't read my book carefully uh, because it's covered in there. Of course, it wasn't really covered in there. There was one sentence uh, was in there. And a statement like that would necessarily be paralyzing because my book, in, in some sense, is about everything. So anything that you say, I could just as well say, well, it was covered in the book you didn't read. It. So I promise never to make that statement again. And the only thing I can say is if, if you do ask a question, that is covered in that form across 40 pages. I will try in some general way to suggest as you review that chapter. <laughs> but I, I'm going to play that down now because I see that that would be absolutely intimidating. Okay, today we are thinking in essentials. Or rather, we're thinking about thinking in essentials. Uh, I was thinking when uh, Professor Bidger gave his introductory list of announcements which were, by their nature, completely disconnected from each other, what would you say if I asked you to summarize the essence of what he said <laughs> during that? And it would be physically impossible uh, to do because there was no common denominator. There was nothing that would boil it all down. It was just spread out all over the place. But what we want to do now is, that's no criticism of him because he had to make those announcements. What we want to do is find out what you're thinking. You cannot have just a flood of de detail like that. You have to think in essentials. And let's plunge in with a definition of essential, or of essence. The word essence. Now this I'm taking from the Oxford English Dictionary. That which constitutes the being of a thing. That by which it is what it is. Unquote. That which constitutes the being of the thing, that by which it is what it is. And of course it comes from the Latin essay, to, uh, the infinitive, to be or being. So the essence is the being of something, that which makes it itself. Now different philosophies interpret this term and its application differently. Objectivism holds that it does not, it is not a metaphysical but an epistemological term. In other words, metaphysically, we do not believe in discrimination 
against some features of an entity in favor of others. Every feature that an entity possesses constitutes the being or part of the being of that thing, and none can be thrown aside as non-essential. For example, man has a heart, and that is part of him, even though it's not distinctive to him and it doesn't appear in his de the definition of man, Metaphysically, it's as essential, in fact, more essential than certain other things. Even having five fingers is part of the being of man. It's an essential metaphysic. It's not an accident. It has its causes in the whole evolutionary development and the other organs. So <coughs> every feature of man, and, and this would be true of any entity, makes it what it is. You can't distinguish the essential from the non-essential metaphysic. But for objectivism, essence of the essential is an epistemological category. So I would reword the Oxford uh, definition follows, as follows. The essential is that which constitutes the being of a unit. That by which something is a member of a concept. that by which it belongs in a certain class. <coughs> in other words, the essential for us are characteristics that you take in order to conceptualize in some form, in order to break the, the whole perceptual field up into groups which you then are going to uh, abstract away the differences and unite and make a concept, or if not a concept, then a class that you describe by a number of concepts. And this is specifically a human function. We pick the attributes that are to be essential. Of course, we do it objectively, not subjectively, but nevertheless, we have to do it. It depends on our context of knowledge and our cognitive purpose, and what is essential in one context can change in the other. Now, let us briefly quickly review <coughs> the theory of definition that objectivism holds so we understand how essence is applied to definition. But of course, in this lecture, we're thinking more broadly than definitions, but I'm going to start by reminding you of the theory of definition. And the problem of concepts is that at the very beginning, you can define concepts or keep them clearly demarcated from each other and clearly connected to objects in reality simply by pointing. That's what's called an ostensive definition. You point to instances of it. But after uh, some of this at the early stage, you get so many concepts and so many higher level concepts, and including so many unions of concepts of matter with concepts of consciousness, that pointing will no longer keep your concepts separated from each other and clearly connected to something in reality. And that's the point where you need explicit definitions. And if you remember Ms. Rand's discussion of definition, there are two basic uh, acts, two basic processes that you have to engage in to reach a definition, to reach an essence. You have to choose a distinguishing feature. Now, I'm not going to keep saying because it's very awkward. Feature or features. You can just put the parenthesis S on the wall next to you and think of it every time that you want the plural. But uh, <clears throat> you have to choose a distinguishing feature that sets the entity apart from everything else you know. You might in some context say man talks and nothing else does. And that would distinguish him, and that would be OK in that context. And then, if and when you get many distinctive features, you choose among them the one which is, the key word here is? Fundamental. fundamental. The one which underlies, makes possible, or leads to the rest of the distinctive features, or if not all of them, at least a larger number than anything else explains. So that the process of arriving at <coughs> an essence involves the two processes that are essential to all cognition in some form. And those two processes are differentiation. taking apart and putting together, or differentiation and integration, which is the objectivist terms for it. Now, differentiation in this case consists of selecting a distinctive characteristic. You differentiate not just perceptually by seeing this versus that. You, you differentiate by listing the thing's characteristics against the other things you know, and then picking one and saying, this is what sets it apart. That's how you differentiate. And integration, in this case, is done via 
fundamentality, which means done via what principle of metaphysics? The law of? Causality. Causality, exactly. By finding an attribute which is in some sense underlying a whole group or the cause of a whole group and thus carrying along the whole group in your mind as one total. Now I want you to notice here, which is very crucial, that both these processes, as they apply to forming an essence, involve a form of unit reduction. Now you know that the essence of the conceptual level, according to Ms. Rand, is unit reduction. The crow epistemology, the need to compress as much information as possible into the fewest units possible. Now, essentials, forming essentials, is one crucial way of accomplishing this conceptual purpose in both of its aspects. How does it enable us to perform unit reduction? First of all, you, f you face a mass of sprawling data, say about human beings. The first thing you do in order to reach a distinctive characteristic is discard. You discard part of the data as irrelevant, as not distinctive to the phenomenon being discussed, being studied as non-essential. This right away reduces the number of units that you have to focus on. If you came to man, to stick to that example, to define him, and you know you want to distinguish him, and you say, let's say, I'm going to distinguish him from dogs and cats, then right away, all of his attributes as a physical entity, that he's three-dimensional, that he has a certain kind of height, and, uh, you know, that he attracts every other man with a force directly proportional, etc., etc. All of the things from physics get discarded. They don't get evaded, but they get discarded as this is not essential because I want what distinguishes man from such and such, and they all have that. So already, the sheer act of looking for a distinction helps you to get rid of all kinds of data that you don't have to focus on, otherwise you would just sit there paralyzed. Now you further reduce the, the data once you've got the distinctive characteristics by selecting one. And here again, it's the one out of the many, although it's a different many, and therefore a different kind of one. You select the one which underlies all or most of the elements that you've retained. That's the fundamental. So now you need, to, of all those that you've retained, you need to retain only that one if you see that it leads to uh, all the others. If you do uh, classify your concepts and define them in those terms, then you will be able instantly to recall the whole to totality that uh, uh, you were selecting from. As the case, if you remember the example in the book, defining man as a being who has a thumb, even if that's distinctive, it doesn't lead to any other of his characteristics. It hasn't been processed by you as a signal or symptom or, or indication of 50,000 other facts and therefore it just floats free as, oh yeah, he's something that's got a thumb, it doesn't, doesn't take you anywhere. Whereas if you first see that 50 characteristics of man reduced to rationality and then you define him as, rational, as a rational being, whenever you think of man, the moment you sum the definition up, that de de definitional characteristic immediately carries in its weight all the rest of the di distinguishing things and brings the full entity uh, before you. Now I had a student at one point who is now a faculty member here, Linda Reardon, and uh, she wrote a very good sentence on this in a paper that she did for our class. And I thought rather than paraphrase it, I'll give her the credit and read her sentence. This is just one sentence she wrote for a paper some time ago, but it captures this point very nicely. Thinking in essentials is the indispensable process of programming the subconscious mind for the instantaneous recall of everything one knows about a subject whenever the need for such recall arises. The recall of this information is the formation of a context. Should I repeat that? <laughs> Think, well, all right, okay. Thinking in essentials is the indispensable process of programming the subconscious mind for the instantaneous recall 
of everything one knows about a subject. And that's whenever the need for such recall arises. And then her next very good sentence, the recall of this information is the formation of a context. In other words, you, we said before, you must keep man integrated, or whatever you're thinking about, integrated by holding the whole context. But how do you summon up that whole context? Well, if you just thought of man as a thumb haver, you know, nothing much is there to remind you of all the other knowledge you have. But if you bring up the essential, that brings up everything you know about man, and in contrast to all the other things you know, it provides you with the whole ready-made context of the ties, the hooks between this and everything else that you know that's essentially similar or essentially different. And so, this is an essential way of keeping the context or of keeping your knowledge integrated. So you can put the division of labor like this in lecture two, we stress the importance of keeping knowledge integrated. But today we are discussing one of the techniques by which you do it. You can't just do it by goodwill and say, I really want to keep things integrated. You have to know where to start looking. What do you integrate to? And one very essential element in this process is looking, putting your knowledge initially into your mind in terms of essentials. And then when it comes out, it comes out with the context that will give you the leads as to how to integrate. <coughs> this essentials is really a technique of integrating, a specific type of technique in to enable you to achieve the, the goal of integration. Now, so far we've been talking about uh, essentials in the standard sense of uh, how they apply to the theory of definition. But I want to broaden the application of this now much beyond defining a concept. It'll be the same basic process, setting aside, discarding, and then trying to find a fundamental that unites, but it's not restricted to a concept. I'm using the term essence, therefore, much more broadly than Aristotle, or in most cases, Ms. Rand did, but for what I regard as the same process. I think, for instance, you can say, what is the essence of a specific book you see, which is not a, not a concept, not a book as such, but some particular book, like the Critique of Pure Reason. Or what is the essence of a certain movie? Or what is the essence of a certain person? Etc. Uh, what is essential if you're going to engage in a certain activity? And those are all, in my opinion, essentially the same <laughs> as what you do when you form a definition. It's the same process, only the result is not an essence, but a certain kind of highly stylized description which enables you to know exactly what you're dealing with. Now let's start on a, on a rather simple uh, case. The essence of the critique of pure reason. I don't mean simple in that, you know, the ideas are simple, but simple in the sense that you, you must, you all generally know the doctrine of that uh, book. So the first thing you have to do is set aside everything that is not distinctive. Now Kant is full of things that are not distinctive to him, as is every philosopher, because if every sentence was unique, you couldn't even make any communication. For instance, uh, Kant is in favor of the American Revolution, not in the critique, but elsewhere. So when we put down that uh, he's a revolutionary in favor of freedom, obviously not. He certainly, that is not distinctive to him. And further, when you read down, he contradicts it all over the place. But leaving, leaving, leaving out the contradiction, that has to be discarded as non-essential uh, to what is distinctively Kantian. It would be essential only if you could show that the, what is really essential inexorably involves being for the American Revolution. But in Kant's case, in fact, it's the reverse. How about the fact that Kant comes out staunchly against lying? Is that an essential? No, it's not an essential, because all kinds of people have come out against lying. The question is, why does he come out against lying? How does he validate coming out against lying? What is Kantian about that? <coughs> Objectivists aren't in favor of most lies, and there's been lots of what they call deontologists who think you should never lie, and you're not yet Kantian. Well, how about Kant believed that our experience takes place in space and time? Whereas mystics say that uh, it doesn't. 
uh, that they enter another dimension without space and time. Is that distinctive to Khan? Well, it sets them aside from a certain kind of mystic, but obviously there's vast numbers of people. How about Khan thinks all knowledge starts with the evidence of the senses? Is that distinctive? No. Certainly not, although he believes it. How about Kant may, lays great stress on the conceptual faculty? <laughs> no. Uh, Ayn Rand does, Aristotle does, Plato does. And yet all of these are true of him. So it's not necessary that we're throwing all of these out, but there must be some kind of interpretation of these things that is distinctive, that sets him apart from everybody else, otherwise he's just an eclectic hodgepodge of everything that came before. Now who would have an idea of what is distinctive? Let's just take Kant's view of space and time, the senses and concept. What is distinctive about his view? He thinks we have to use all of these things. We have to perceive in space and time, and we have to start with sensory data, and we have to use concepts. And therefore, according to him, what? They're determined by the structure of our mind, not by reality. And, and, and he knows that how? Or how does he reach that conclusion? It's true. He thinks those are all part of the inborn structure of the mind, one, on one level or another, that you don't get any, you don't get the knowledge of them or the faculties themselves uh, from perception of reality. So he comes to the conclusion that since they're all uh, just part of the subjective structure of the mind, anything we learn through these means is is what? Is subjective or is invalid or is not indicative of true reality. We only can use the faculties we have, and since we can't escape those faculties, they have to be invalid or non-cognitive. Now that certainly makes him distinct. Now what is the principle going to the issue of fundamentality that underlies uh, this idea? What underlies the idea that if you have to use a certain faculty, you can't rely on? We have to go through space and time, we have to go through the senses, we have to go through certain concepts, therefore they're not reliable. Well then we ask, what, what would be reliable? Yeah. Identity invalidates consciousness. That, well, you certainly went right to the, <laughs> the heart of the essence there, that's true. Uh, uh, just to get there in a step though, the, uh, those faculties would, would be reliable if only we didn't have to use them. If only we could circumvent them by using other faculties, no, because then we would still have to use those others. So what would be a reliable consciousness? One which had no faculties, no means of knowledge, nothing that it had to do, and therefore nothing that would be distorted, except it would then be conscious by no means. It would be unconscious. So then we get to uh, Mr. Karp's summary. The fundamental principle on which he's operating that leads him to all these distinctive tenets is identity disqualifies consciousness. And that, of course, was uh, Ms. Rand's bringing that observation as to what constitutes the essence of Kant. <coughs> So you see, in principle, thinking in essentials about a book or a, or a philosophy or a doctrine <clears throat> is the same process as thinking in essentials with regard to defining a particular concept like man or whichever. You have a whole raft of data, you discard the non-distinctive, and then you try to see what is it that underlies or leads to or causes the, uh, the, uh, what, what you have retained. In other words, you look for the fundamental. Now, uh, just a word here on <clears throat> terminology. We talk about the fundamental as causing the derivative, but I almost always throw in, or underlies, or makes possible, etc. And the reason is because there are actually many different relationships that come under what we call fundamental versus derivative. It's used in a lot of different contexts. It's not always simple cause and effect. For instance, we say rationality is the fundamental, the ability to speak French is a derivative. Well, that it would be the relationship of an attribute uh, to its exercise, you see, or a general capacity to its particular application. That's not the same as cause and effect in the sense that when you strike a match in, in a room full of gasoline, the effect is an explosion. 
But you can see in what way one underlies and makes possible the other. Or we can say a basic premise such as identity disqualifies consciousness will lead to and then reel off the results of the Kantian system. Now that is really a deductive consequence. Given that premise, all of those consequences uh, follow. So it's the fundamental is the cause in the sense of at least the necessary condition, but not always the necessary and sufficient condition. In other words, rationality doesn't cause you to speak French. It makes it possible. It's one requirement, and it's in that sense that it underlies the ability to speak French. Uh, but you, you shouldn't be thrown off by this word cause to mean that whenever the fundamental is present, that automatically triggers the derivative because we use it more broadly than that. The fundamental is a precondition which in normal circumstances will lead to the derivative, assuming that the other aspects involved in the derivative uh, hold true. <coughs> now I want to give you some examples from my own thinking. I think you're probably familiar with these, but that's why they're good examples to inject right at this point of thinking in essentials in a sense is broader than definitions. And you're, the experience of it is always like this. You're first you're confronted by a sprawling mass of data that you can't make anything out of. Something like the list of announcements that you got at the beginning today. I mean, it just goes on and on in all directions. Now, what you then have to do is discard, get rid of as much as possible as non-distinct and then try to uh, look for the causal root, the fundamental that will tie it uh, together. Whereas thinking in non-essentials would be taking characteristics at random, whether they're distinctive or not, and or whether they are fundamental, whether they underlie a whole group or not. Now, in, in my lifetime, I've done this many times, but twice I've done it in print, so uh, on a complex example, I want to refer to each of those um, um, for a moment. Uh, the best example I had in, in my writing is um, uh, in the discussion, uh, in the chapter in the Omnibus Parallels, uh, dealing with Weimar culture, which I regard is by far the best, the second best chapter in that book, but the best epistemologically from this point of view. Now, I, I mentioned this, I, I know, in my talk about Ms. Rand, but I want to go a little more detail here from the point of view of stressing uh, the essentials. I was going over all these different aspects of Weimar culture and making notes, physics and math and education and literature and painting and music, and then just had a sprawling mass of data. And of course, the data doesn't come pure, it comes along with the liberal commentators' uh, interpretation of what it means. So you just have a mass of you don't know what. And I, I'm having a feeling there's some kind of tremendous common denominator here in all these fields, but I don't know what. So the first thing I have to do is start discarding. The first thing I discard is everything that people tell you this is what it means, because they make everything essentially unique and distinct from everything else, and you can't do any integrating. For instance, uh, physics was presented as, uh, the, the modern Heisenberg physics was presented as devotion to measurement, empiricism, and the virtue of humility. <laughs> because you, you couldn't know, uh, you know, uh, perfectly. And education was presented as gentleness, uh, progressive education as gentleness as against the harsh dogmatism of Prussia. So that was what they offered as the essential. That we were gentle, and part of being gentle was we didn't force a curriculum on the kids or any knowledge on the kids or any code of behavior on the kids or even any criminal law. Uh, I, you went through like this with every topic. You know, you just have to throw it out, say that does not explain it. Meanwhile, the more, as, as you start discarding it, you start seeing that there is something left that is distinctive that ties all these together. Now in real life you don't always first make a list of what's distinctive and then find the fundamental. Usually what happens in most many cases is you discard and what you have left uh, is like 
you just need Newton's apple. And then you suddenly see what's the common denominator, the fundamental that unites and explains them all. And in this case, as I've already told you, in a, or told an audience in another class, uh, this was the, uh, the, the, the Newton's apple in this instance was watching the streaker on TV on the Academy Awards. Uh, I was with Miss Rand, and this, that was the year when this guy ran by uh, naked. And uh, I had been thinking about my chapter on Weimar culture, and I couldn't exactly put it all together, but I knew there was something the same. And uh, Miss Rand asked me, what did I think of that? I said, well, you know, I certainly didn't approve of it, but it didn't, uh, you know, mean a great deal. So she said, well, what? How would you explain? I said something like, well, it's completely irrational. She said, no, that's much too broad. Jane Fonda, as I remember, she said, is irrational too, but that's a, there's a distinction <laughs> between this type and the other. So then I said something like, well, it must be some you know, stupid college prank. She said, no. When they went and raided panties, that was a college prank, or <clears throat> swallowed goldfish, you know. But this is a different category than just a prank. So I said, well, Oh, uh, he's uh, exhibitionistic. He wants, you know, TV exposure and national attention. And she said, no, that isn't what wouldn't be valid because so do quiz show guests and hosts and, you know, the celebrities that appear on them and so on, and that doesn't explain this behavior. So I can see that I was giving, you know, all these sort of unthinking because non-distinctive, nothing tailored to that as an explanation. And I could see that she was taking it very big because she was building up the armament for <laughs> a real analysis here. Um, in any event, she then went on to describe, she, she said, now listen, I'm going to describe the situation as it essentially is, stripping away all the non-essentials, and then you tell me what it is. Here we have this solemn occasion where Hollywood is trying to be as glamorous as possible. This was still true in those days. I mean, the men had tuxedos and the women had gowns instead of strings. <laughs> and, uh, their hair was on the back of their head instead of the front. And there was the expectation of you know, awards for achievement. And it was like everybody was on their best behavior, had the most elegant and, uh, occasion. The whole country was, was uh, looking in. And then, in her uh, inimitable words, here is this creature who wants to stick his bare ass in their face. <laughs> now, what does that tell you? She said, that's not a prank or a, you know, a exhibitionist on TV. He wants to smash this occasion. He wants to do the exact opposite. He wants to destroy the glamour and the, you know, the importance and the excitement by bringing it down to the exact opposite, you know the low, the vulgar, the, the, the crude. And she said, what kind of motivation can it be? It's the destruction of glamour for its own sake. And from there we got into a discussion of nihilism, of which she took the streaker as an example. And of course, as soon as she said that, I thought that's exactly what's true of all of these different fields. Every one of them, the actual essence of them is the destruction of a field for the sake of destruction, not to put something else in its place that's better, but just to get rid of, to wipe out. And in the same way the streaker wanted to destroy glamour at the Academy Award, the physicists want to destroy law, and the mathematicians want to destroy deductive certainty, and the artists want no heroes and no grammar. Uh, everyone, interestingly, goes to the essence of the field, and the essence is to destroy the essence. See, that's, that's, that's what's unique about nihilism. They sense the essence of a certain field, whether art or science or whatever, and then their goal becomes to destroy the field through destroying its essence. They don't prohibit literature. You can still write, but there can't be any plot, intelligible characters, syntax, etc. Not if it's to, you know, be greeted as avant-garde. So the goal is to take the essential attributes of literature and obliterate them. And that they do it in every uh, field. So that is the fundamental, the one and the many. That is what integrates all of these things. And you have, when you do understand it, as vicious and corrupt as the phenomenon is, that you're co co contemplating nihilism dominating the whole culture, it's intellectually very clarifying and satisfying because you go from just 
unintelligible insanity that you can't make any sense of or connection of. And you suddenly can see the same principle sweeping across everywhere. And then if you can understand that principle, uh, you are, uh, at least you're in control intellectually uh, of what's happening. So that, I think, is the best single example in my own experience uh, where I had to perform this on a grand scale. Now there I was trying to define the essence of a culture, of one specific culture. So I wasn't defining a concept. But here again, it was the same, the same process of discarding and then uniting through some fundamental. Now I've done it one other time in print, and I'm going to read you a paragraph from that. Uh, because I think this will be familiar to you. This is from Why Johnny Can't Think. And again, I had the same experience. Uh, that is, you, first you collect data, and it's all disorganized, and a lot of it is irrelevant, but you don't know what's relevant or what not, so you just take notes. So I went to this progressive institution on Bank Street in, in New York, and uh, I'll just read you a paragraph from that because that'll give you an idea of what I encountered for those of you who don't remember or haven't read this talk. It's reprinted in The Voice of Reason. I had said, I'm quoting you, I had said that I was interested in observing how children are taught concepts, and the school obligingly directed me to three classes. The first for nine and ten years old, ten year olds, was a group discussion of 13 steps in seal hunting from cutting the hole in the ice at the start to sharing the blubber with others at the end. The teacher gave no indication of the purpose of this topic, but he did indicate <clears throat> that the class would later perform a play on seal hunting and perhaps even computerize the steps. The next class for 13-year-olds <clears throat> consisted of a mock Washington hearing on the question of whether there should be an import tax on Japanese cars. Student played senators, Japanese lobbyists, Lee Iacocca, and so on, and did it quite well. The teacher sat silently observing. I never learned the name of this course or of the seal hunting one, but finally I was to observe a meeting described to me as a class in English. At last I thought an academic subject, but no, the book being covered was Robert Kennedy's 13 Days, a memoir of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. A typical topic for discussion was whether a surgical airstrike against Cuba would have been better policy than a blockade. Now, the rest of the, my article details other things uh, that I found, just that I noted as I went by. And each time I tried to explain it on a more limited basis and found that's irrelevant because it doesn't, it doesn't explain it. It doesn't differentiate, for instance, the discussion on Cuba. At first, I was tempted to say, well, they're giving them some current affairs. But then, you know, there's a lot of ways of giving people current affairs. So to say that they're interested in current affairs doesn't tell you anything yet. There's something specific about giving them current affairs by reading a book of Kennedy and discussing air tactics uh, than the other ways that you could do it. And then the one about the Eskimos and seal hunting, I thought, well, that's obviously to, to teach them ethnicity. But why are they teaching it to them in this particular way? And I said, there's something in common between the seal hunting one and uh, the, uh, the, the Cuban uh, discussion. Only I didn't know what it was, but there's something in common that has nothing to do with ethnicity or current affairs. And then um, the same for the mock hearings. Well, they're giving them government was the idea. But again, they're giving them government in a very unique way. Not even in so broad of terms as should there be import restrictions? Or should there be import restrictions in manufacturing? But what is the right, right answer when Lee Iacocca comes again, Mr. Shu, and they both want the price to be different, what should it be? Now, how does that tie into the, the uh, seal hunting one and, uh, and uh, the Cuban one? Well, it's, it's getting progressively clear to me that something crucial is omitted. And then I found the look-say method, where they counted only on memory. And my temptation was to say, uh, well, this is, a, this is mistaken because they count on memory. But, but what, some memory is OK, some memory is unavoidable. So why is this particular form of learning the alphabet uh, through memory, learning words through memory, why, what's wrong with that? 
And then I went to the science class and they were all talking about learning by doing. Well, I knew that this was doing and this was no good. But I thought, well, but what's wrong with some doing? What is the essential flaw in this doing? And it's by gradually discarding all of these obvious things, I was able to get out a description something like this. It's current events without any principles. Ethnicity with no wider meaning. Politics strictly in terms of concretes. Memory with no abstractions to guide. Doing without the knowledge of any laws to govern. And of course, if you put it that way, what leaps out in all those different formulations is concrete without the conceptual level, without abstractions, the anti-conceptual mentality. That is the basic approach which leads to all those as uh, manifestations. Now you could read that article if you're interested to see it worked out. The relevant point here though is that uh, it was just exactly like the Weimar culture case where you start with a mass of data, you discard and discard as irrelevant, and then they did some things well, I think they said the Pledge of Allegiance, but I had to you know, discard that, that's not part of this phenomenon. And there were some survivals from the older education which were good, but I never could have come to this conclusion unless I had discarded that as not distinctive. I mean, the traditional adding and subtracting and writing paragraphs and so on is not why this particular school was famous and that's not distinctive. That had to be discarded. And then when you get to the distinctive, you try to pull out what is the fundamental that underlies and unites them all. Uh, so it's, it, it is not necessarily an easy thing to do, but if you know where you're going, uh, it's an engrossing subject if you first steep yourself in enough data. If you try to jump too fast, you don't have enough of an inductive base to know, you know what is a distinctive and what isn't. You have to get enough so you have at least five or ten instances of it's a confusing field. Uh, and then see what you can do. It. Uh, I find personally these kind of broad integrations the single best part of philosophy. I would never have gone into philosophy if, you, if it didn't offer the possibility once every decade of taking 20 things that have seemingly nothing in common and seeing them all as an instance of one thing. That is the supreme pleasure for me in philosophy, and that's why I feel a certain, in quotes, kinship with Plato who had this mystic vision where everything was united into one. Because if I were to go bad, I would go bad in that way rather than like an empiricist who just stares concretely at every percept as it goes by. But there is a pleasure in integration um, for me, and I don't think for most people. It's tremendously clarifying, and at the same time it feels like you're actually expanding your mind, like you're getting smarter because you can see such esoteric things so clearly. And of course, you're, all you're doing is economizing the units by dropping out some and bringing all, all the others under one formulation. And I think I mentioned to you already that Ayn Rand was, was the, the world champion of this skill. I always felt that she was standing on a mountaintop and had the whole universe as the background. And whatever you would say, the radar would go out to connect it to everything that was similar and different and she would right away come right back with what, uh, what it means and where it comes from. And, uh, it, it was uh, completely different from what you would see from ordinary people. Now I think I'll mention one negative example here, or a few negative examples, thinking in non-essentials, just to contrast with uh, what we've done so far. And this is a, is a true example also from my experience with Ms. Rand. And uh, this, I believe I've mentioned in some course, so I have to forgive me if I'm repeating it, but it's, it's too good an example not to mention. This was in the early 50s, um, when I first moved to the United States and President Truman, uh, oh, was, it, was he in the 50s? Yeah, late, like 51, I think he was. Um, uh, had seized the steel mills where there was a strike on pretext of national uh, uh, welfare. And this at the time was, it was a major step because it had never been done. Private property was still, there was lip service to the idea that it, industry was sacrosanct uh, and so on. And um, therefore it was a big turning point if he could get away with this uh, seizure. And of course, 
Conrad and her friends fought against it. At, conservatives in general fought against it as, as a monstrous uh, president. But what we heard the other conservatives at the time saying uh, was seared into my mind as an example of non-essential thing. A lot of their commentary focused on the fact that steel is involved. And steel is really crucial to the economy and must be left in private hands. And so one of these people was actually convinced by an objectivist and then came back and said, well, I see that it applies to steel, but what about coal? <laughs> and that, that was the level on which they functioned, that the essence of this event was they took over steel. Other people said, what's wrong with this was that Truman's seizure involved the executive branch taking over the industry, and this is the proper prerogative of Congress, and there was no law authorized. And that's what they were fighting about. This is dictatorship by the, by the, uh, by the presidency instead of by Congress. And those people are still talking about the imperial presidency, but what they want is the imperial speaker. And other ones, uh, a lot of the Republicans were saying, the trouble is it's the Democrats uh, that are behind it. They are taking it away for selfish reasons and powerless, whereas if we, the Republicans, did it, it would only be in the name of the welfare of the country as a whole. And other people were saying it's okay because he didn't steal their property. He merely temporarily took over control of it. So in other words, he behaved like Hitler rather than Stalin. <laughs> now, there was a torrent of writing and analysis. But all these people were helpless to analyze this event, to evaluate it, or to prevent its recurrence. The most they could say was, our gang will do it better. We'll do it for the public welfare. Now, if you were hearing all this, and then you heard Ayn Rand's analysis, by contrast, you'd see what thinking in essentials is. Because she saw all the details, she knew that it was Truman and the executive and the Democrats and Steele and all the rest of it. But she swept them all aside. The first thing she did is discard all that as non-distinctive and non-essential. What were the essentials? What was left after she realized the exact same phenomenon could take place with coal or under the Congress or you know, under a new party, etc. So all that is just out. She discarded. And then what is the essential? Some men are producing, are creating, which involves an act of independent thought. And others, the government officials involved, whoever, whatever their party or, or, or office, are directing them, not by virtue of creative skill, but by the power of a gun, the power of physical force, which is all that the government has to back up its edicts. The essence, therefore, of this instance of nationalization, she said, is the rule of force over mind. And that is the essence that would endure no matter what country you're talking about, what branch of government, what industry, etc. And on that level, once she can, once she can integrate all these phenomena under that one principle, she can explain why the policy of force only works to paralyze and stop the minds involved, that a mind can't work under force, and that the only result, therefore, can be what happens in status countries, the atrophy of production, poverty, etc. And so she would reach from that one example, properly analyze the evil of government control, control of any industry for any purpose at any time. Strictly, and that's how she reached her whole philosophy. It's not that she had uh, divine revelations, but she always went to the essence. And uh, she would spend a long time, she could talk about something like the steel industry at that time for 12 hours at a time, for week, a week at a time, as long as she was still trying to get at what is distinctive about this, and how does it relate to what the progressives did in the earlier years of this century, and how does it relate to uh, the New Deal, and how does it at always trying to strip away, discard, find what's left, and then integrate it to a broader principle, and then where does that principle come from? And as you know, ultimately she would tie the principle of initiation of force back to something like identity disqualifies consciousness, which had come up in another discussion, you see. And that's how she finally ended up with the total philosophy, because everything was integration through essentials and then integration of what you've already integrated. So this 
I, I think she gives you a good example, some good examples of thinking in uh, uh, essentials. Now I've got a couple of examples here that I want to give you of thinking in non-examples, and non-essentials. That are things that people really do and say, and have you tell me why this is non-essential. Well, one that used to be very prevalent until I guess about the, uh, I think about the 60s is when this one died out. The fundamental choice is communism versus fascism. When I first came to this country, uh, everyone who was not a communist was automatically labeled, including me, a fascist. And that was just considered a factual description. I think actually it was the Goldwater election that put an end to that because he was, whatever his deficiencies, he was obviously not a fascist. So they got the idea there must be something else besides fascism and communism. But before that time, there was only those two choices. Now why is this thinking in non essential to say that? Well, you have to say, if you're thinking in the field of politics, what is the fundamental question? Because the fundamental will be that which underlies and governs all the other questions. And therefore, that will be the basis on which to make essential distinction. Now, what is the fundamental question in uh, politics? Will it be accepted? No, not will it be accepted. A lot of bad, horrible politics, politics can be accepted. That is not the fundamental question. First of all, philosophy is concerned with how uh, government should be organized, how society should be run, not will, will people do it. If they don't do it, then you have to either fight them or psychoanalyze them. In the back. All right, put it, you say freedom versus slavery is the essential, but put it another way. What is the function of the government? What is its basic role or purpose? And you have only got two answers in principle. Either it's to protect individual rights or not. If it's anything other than protect individual rights, it has to be directly or indirectly infringing individual rights. And that means the alternative has to be freedom or slavery of some kind. Now then, if you want to say, what is a fundamental or essential distinction in politics? You would say, a system which favors rights versus one which denies rights. Capitalism versus communism are essentially different. Because on that one fundamental issue, the issue which defines the essence of the field, they have opposite views. But suppose you take communism and fascism and say, are they essentially different? Well, if if the essence, if the fundamental question is their attitude toward individual liberty, then obviously fascism and communism are interchangeable. They are two mildly different variants of the same idea. Uh, one is against private property explicitly, and the other is, claims to be for it, but uh, decides that it will have all the prerogatives of ownership. So it's the same thing in two different ways. One is materialist, the communist, one is religious, the fascist, one is internationalist, one is nationalist, but all of that, there's dozens of differences, but none of it affects what is the function of uh, uh, the government. Those two are just variations on a theme. And so here you have this bromide, which was the, the worst assault, I'm thinking in terms of essentials, dominating political discourse for decades. Uh, today they just are, are too ashamed to say it because they've decided that communism has failed too. So they don't say you don't hear this anymore, but it really was true that your parents' generation or maybe your grandparents thought that this was self-evident and that there was nothing else to be but a communist or a fascist. Let me give you one more example before we take our uh, break of a, of a really bad thinking in essential which is not as widely known uh, and typically comes from a staunch political conservative. And his name, if you care, is M. Stanton Evans. He's associated with various periodicals. I, I'm not sure he's still alive, but he was at one time, probably still. <laughs> but he's still alive. <laughs> at one time, he said the following. He was arguing, I believe it was in an article, uh, that religion is the only possible source of freedom. 
you know, the standard conservative idea that this country was founded on God and uh, his uh, God-given right. But <clears throat> he had it worked out a little more uh, professionally than just, you know, the people who chant on the street. This was his explanation. He had three explanations, three aspects of religion that, that separately and together make it the real source of political liberty. The first one, he says, religion limits the secular authorities. And he said that, for example, under the pagan civilization, for instance, in ancient Athens, they could put Socrates to death if the majority didn't like him. Uh, they considered the human mass all-powerful and not subject to any higher power. Whereas he said a Christian would never permit such a thing as the death of Socrates or a religious person because he realizes that man has an allegiance to something higher than his own desires, namely to God, and that therefore the state must also be limited and subject to those higher authorities. So that's number one. Religion limits the secular authorities. Then he went on, <clears throat> religion introduced the stress on the individual soul. And that's true. Christianity did do that. The idea that each individual is precious, he's made in the image of God, as against the pagans, you know, tended to be very collectivist, and they would write off whole, po whole populations as ba, ba, which is the way the Persians spoke, and they called them barbarians. Uh, and they took slaves en masse from these uh, countries when they went to war on the ground that these were, these were sub-human sub creatures, or they were, they were uh, you know, the, the idea that each one is an individual would instruct them as simply bizarre. But the Christians introduced the idea that each individual, whether he's a slave, a master, or a citizen, or a foreigner, uh, has an individual soul which is precious. And uh, uh, Evans argued this is a crucial legacy of religion without which we could never have had the individualism uh, that we have in a uh, free country. And finally he said, religion was essential to the what we would call a separation of powers in the government, or what he called the equipoise or diffusion of power in the government. And he said, for example, we saw in the feudal period that each class had its own definite right, not each class, but each caste, had its own definite rights and responsibilities and couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't infringe on the rights of the, of the next. Even the king, when he was pushed against the wall by the nobles in 1215, had to say, yes, there's certain things I can't do. I don't have all power, none of us have all power. The powers are separated down here because concentration of power is only above us. As against the totalitarian approach, you see, which is all power in the government. This is really a variant on the limit on secular authorities, but it's from the point of view of power being diffused and not in any one agency's hands. And he ascribes that to religion. Now, you see, if you leave that with enough citations and quotations, so just enough to overload your mind so you can't retain, uh, retain the essence, you come away, or you, many people would come away with a, a sort of uncomfortable feeling, well, yeah, I guess there's a lot of things here, and religion did uh, contribute to uh, freedom, uh, something to be said for that, and then they'll hear a uh, lecture uh, from an objectivist, why religion is the enemy of a freedom in America. So, yeah, it's something to be said for that, too. And who can know? It's all a matter of opinion. <laughs> now, what you have to do in a case like that is think in terms of essentials and ask whether any one or all of these three criteria are essentials of freedom. In other words, do they distinguish freedom from slavery? Are they distinctive to freedom? They, here's, here's the first one. Limit on secular authorities. Because man is subject to higher authority. Well, the, suppose you have a society in which the secular authorities are really limited. Does that entail freedom? Does that distinguish a free country from a slave country? No. Absolutely not. It leaves open the exchange of one kind of slavery for another, namely, slavery to the secular government replaced by 
theocracy. Slavery to the church officials, to the, to the theocratic uh, power. So it is certainly not uh, an essential of freedom. Now, a limit on the secular authority would be really great if the reason for it was the supremacy of individual rights, which man's life on earth requires, and therefore government can't infringe and the secular power is limited. But once you say it, the secular power is limited because we have an all-powerful supernatural master, you've wiped out freedom just as bad or worse, you see. You've taken a non-essential, you see, uh, something that does not distinguish freedom, but that happens to be true of freedom, ignored what makes it es essential in the context, and then go on. Now, the same analysis is applicable to <coughs> the um, emphasis on the, uh, the importance of the individual soul, the, the, what you call the individualist element. Now, certainly it's true that in some form, this is essential to freedom. They had this emphasis on the individual soul through century after century after century of statism, feudalism, theocracy. So what is the, uh, what is the part that, why is this non-essential as stated to freedom? If you say the soul is crucial, and that's all you say, that in itself is not distinctive to freedom, it won't sustain freedom. And in fact, it's compatible with total slavery. Ah. Yes. You're not saying the individual human being. What about the body? What about the yes. Body? What about the body? You say the individual human being. The soul part, you know, you could say, fine, uh, do whatever you like with your precious soul. But here on this corrupt earth, it's encased in a vicious body. And therefore, we need a strong dictator to curb, you know, your animal impulses and your uh, ugly desires for physical wealth, and etc., and so on. Now, if you call emphasis on the soul by itself individualism, then individualism has nothing to do with freedom. It's like a psychological respect for an internal principle that has no relevance to this life. <clears throat> now, when would stress on the individual be essential to freedom? When the individual means not the disembodied soul, the soul-body dichotomy, but the human being, the integration of soul and body. The opposite of the mind-body uh, dichotomy. In other words, when it was part of a this-worldly, secular philosophy, and not an otherworldly, two-reality, clashing philosophy. As to the uh, diffusion of power argument, this is the idea that if you have ten masters, each with one-tenth of the power over you, then you're really free, because none of them has 100%. <clears throat> and obviously, that 10 masters does not change the situation. Uh, and what, what is the real life example of this? The conservatives to this day are, I, I have met conservatives who, whose attitude is, they hope that the uh, Supreme Court invalidates ab abortion, because that is properly a matter to be regulated by, state. by the state. And if they're, if they're upholding court liberty, because liberty means the diffusion of power, and therefore we should give it to the states to decide. Now that is that exact same mentality that is utterly thinking in non-essentials. <clears throat> Everything good about the things he quotes, the emphasis on the individual and diffusion of power, etc., is good only in a context when it's an aspect or an expression of one fundamental, namely, Respect for man's rights, which in turn rests on a philosophy of reason, which in turn is the opposite of religion. So he's taking non-essentials to bring him in a seemingly plausible way to the exact opposite of the truth and coming to the conclusion that religion is the, is the mainstay of freedom. Now if you see this, you can see why it's important that you know how to think in essentials and spot it when somebody is not doing it, because otherwise there can be terrific plausibility, especially if you read rapidly, just get the gist of it, um, to uh, the conclusion these people come to. Now, we're going to take a break, but I want to give you a slight assignment for this five minutes. <laughs> Tell me what is essential to the philosophy of objectivism. What is the essence of objectivism? 
Okay, you have five minutes to figure that out. <laughs> so we've actually taken a seven minute break, seven and a half. So theoretically I should finish at 12, 32 and a half. <laughs> Now, I, I've got the fan near, but I have to keep everything down here. Um, I gave you the question <clears throat> as an exercise. What is the essence of objectivism? <clears throat> and I think I'll start to spare you the, this first early stages by giving you some answers uh, that I have heard explicitly or implicitly from people across the years. Answers which I, I think I can say without tipping off my hand too much are inadequate. Uh, objectivism uh, involves an intense passion for architecture in New York City. <laughs> What's wrong with that? I mean, in one word, that is not. Uh, the essence of objectivism, but rather what? A derivative. Well, it's not even a derivative. A derivative is something that follows from it. Non-essential. Well, all, anything that isn't an essential is non-essential. But I want to know what this is positive. It's an, it's an example of one character created from the point of view of, of objectivist philosophy. It's a concrete. And there would be thousands of possible applications which would not involve New York before New York was ever even discovered or invented, you know, before even uh, architecture was discovered. So you, to take one person and say that's objectivism, a lot of people did that with Ms. Rand. Whatever she liked is objectivism, whatever she didn't is not. And she objected to that uh, as much as anybody else because then that is truly what you would call a cult. Whereas a philosophy has certain ideas, not certain individuals, that are the, the essence. Certain individuals can be magnificent rep <coughs> representatives, eloquent, you know, beautiful, inspiring. <coughs> but the essence has to be, of a philosophy has to be its idea. All right, how about this is another one I was, had suggested. <coughs> Objectivism is a consistent philosophy based on reality. <clears throat> well, it's abstract. You say, yes, it's abstract, but any philosophy, whatever you say, is going to be abstract. There's something a little more wrong with this than just that it's abstract. Suppose a man comes into the room and says to you, <clears throat> I had a great philosophy. And you say, what is it? He says, completely true to reality. No contradictions anywhere. So you say, okay, wait, what is it? He says, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the essence of my philosophy. Now, technically speaking, the description I gave you is a compliment, not an essence. It doesn't tell you anything about the philosophy, it's just your assessment that it's a nice philosophy. <clears throat> now, here's a third one. Is this essential to objectivism? Is all right. You have to watch your word here. Not is this essential to? Is this the essence of objectivism? It starts with existence exists and consciousness is the faculty of perceiving. Is that the essence? No. Well, isn't that the? What are those? Axioms. Those are the axioms, but they don't yet tell you the essence. Now, presumably those axioms that are properly developed will lead to something that distinguishes this philosophy from everything else and that integrates all of its elements, which will be the essence. But the statement of the axioms itself does not make apparent what that essence is. And a lot of people say, I believe that something exists and that I'm conscious of it. What's that got to do with capitalism or, or all, all the rest of it? Well then, <clears throat> let's try this way. If the essence is not a concrete, it's not a complement, it's not the axioms, what about if I did the following? Objectivism, objectivism is the philosophy which advocates reality, reason is man's only means of knowledge, rational self-interest, capitalism and romantic art, and believes that man has the ability to integrate all of these through the power of free will. 
and also the criminal should be punished. <laughs> justice is important. <laughs> and um, independence is an important virtue, but it's the derivative of rationality. And the senses are valid. And um, that's it. That's the essence. Summary. You know, that's a summary. That's a list. <clears throat> that is not the essence. Now, uh, in you know in what way the child's definition of uh, man can be very primitive because in his context of differentiation, so you could say a thing that moves and makes noises, and that's okay for a child. In the same way, if I appear on a TV show and they ask me what's the essence of objectivism, I'll say it stands for reason and selfishness, or reason, selfishness, and capitalism. Because to them in that context, they never heard of that combination. And it immediately differentiates it from everything else they know. Whereas if I told them the real essence, it would be a complete blank. And in the 12 seconds that a TV interview gives you, you'd have no time to explain it. So I give in effect, we often give in writing this childlike definition, which, which is really not the essential. The essence is just a, an essentialized description. But... Uh, we want the essence seriously as philosophy students. If we're going to get to the essence, the first thing we have to do is discard as not relevant. Well, of course, we discard that you have to have orange hair. <laughs> we love architecture in New York. What about being against a woman president? Ayn Rand was strongly against the woman president. Is that, is that a part of the essence of objectivism? Absolutely not. You discard that. A lot of people are against that, who are not objectivists, and she could have never written on that question, and objectivism would have been unaffected. And so the fact that you feel strongly that you disagree with her doesn't mean you disagree with objectivism, unless the reason that you disagree is because you feel that that's the perfect expression of, of ASA, which you really hate. <laughs> but I take it as on its face value, we discard uh, uh, that. <laughs> we then, so we restrict ourselves by this means to seemingly distinctive tenets: capitalism, egoism, reason, reality. Well, to some extent, that's a step because we're taking each field of philosophy and condensing it down to its essential content. So it's the start. But the problem is. None of these terms are the essence as we have stated it. it doesn't, it's not distinctive as stated. For instance, if I say that we advocate reality, well, that will distinguish objectivism, say, from pragmatism. But it certainly won't distinguish objectivism from Plato and Aristotle and the whole classic tradition, who were very strong for uh, reality. Everybody before Kant was for reality. Or if you say you're for reason, well, what exactly is that? Plato was as a, a rationalist. Hegel was a rationalist, etc. So we have not yet, by using these general terms, <coughs> indicated what is distinctive. Nor have we united this list of what we already made via a fundamental. It's again, it's back to a list and not an essence. Well, then we have to decide. What element within a philosophy is the most fundamental that explains the rest? Now, if you have any knowledge, you know it's not ethics and politics or aesthetics. So your choice comes down to metaphysics or epistemology. And according to objectivism, which is the more fundamental of the two insofar as you can separate? Epistemology. Epistemology because that governs the method by which you think, and therefore determines your conclusions in all fields, even including uh, metaphysics. Now, we indicated in our preliminary approach here that reason is the key objectivist concept in epistemology. And we distinguish that, therefore, from mystics and skeptics. But what is really distinctive about the objectivist view of reason? Is it that we utilize the senses as the basis of our conclusions. No. That is what was stated by many people, certainly by Aristotle and others. 
is it that it, we think it's very important to form concepts, the way, for instance, Socrates and Plato, who were the discoverers of concepts, they thought it was crucial to form concepts. No, that's not distinctive to uh, objectivism. What is distinctive to the objectivist view of reason? Yeah. That would set it apart from everything else and at the same time explain all the rest of the philosophy. One thing only at the back. Yeah. Your adherence to reality when using it. Well, what's the name for that? Objective. An objective theory of concepts. An objective theory of concepts. That is what is distinctive, as I argued in my book, and what distinguishes objectivism even from Aristotle, the objective versus the intrinsic and the subjective. And as I also argued in my book, that is what underlies everything else in objectivism. Doctrines in art, in objective values, in politics, and objective rights. And even in metaphysics, we're counting on an objective method to validate things like causality and so on. So the essence, if I were asked to speak without having to popularize, because you couldn't say this on, on a TV show because the, the host wouldn't even know the word concept, let alone <laughs> objective. Uh, <clears throat> essence, I would say, though, in a technical context, is the objectivist theory of co the objective rather theory of concept formation. That's what sets it all apart, and that's what leads to the rest. And that's why, in my in my view, the the most important of, of Ms. Rand's books from the point of view of philosophy is Introduction to Objectivist uh, Epistemology. And if she had not left that book, but had left Atlas, it would be like leaving all the consequences brilliantly and, uh, uh, delineated and the root from which they grew unstated. And I don't think it, uh, it would have had a chance unless someone came along with the, uh, the genius to see it. But luckily, I don't think luckily, because she wouldn't have seen the consequences if she hadn't implicitly at least known the base, but she did do uh, the whole thing. All right, that gives you an idea of how you analyze the essence of a philosophy. And if you can actually see how this theory of concept underlies all the rest of it, which is exactly the mission I gave in my book. My, the mission I gave to myself was not just present objectivism, but present it all from the angle of the theory of concepts as the root. And therefore, uh, uh, my book is deliberately what I would call an essentialized presentation of objectivism. I left out everything that was not necessary to establish the objective theory of concepts and its role everywhere else. That's all I wrote about. So that's a good book from that point of view. <clears throat> now I want to take a different kind of exercise. Now some of these exercises are fairly time consuming, so I suppose I should give you a choice to ask questions, but I think some of them are pretty helpful. So I think I'm going to preempt part of the question period today with the idea that you're going to have a whole hour tomorrow, uh, so maybe we'll get through these a little faster, but some of these I know classes have found helpful, so I'd like to uh, uh, give them to you. Let's take the essence of a person. Does that interest you as a topic? Yes. Yep. <coughs> that has to be of interest. <clears throat> because you deal with people all the time, and you deal with yourself all the time. And having a correct view of yourself or of others is one of the crucial problems in life. And that means knowing what's essential and what isn't. And it's again, it's the same process. <clears throat> and we've been using to reach definitions of the essence of a book, the essence of a philosophy. Now I'm going to do it on a fictional character uh, from the fountain. Because the great thing about fiction as an example is all the relevant facts are given and known. Now if I take a real life person like Ross Perot, and you ask me what is the essence, I'd say I haven't a clue. <laughs> because I don't even know the facts yet. I don't know. I know a few contradictory things and a few generalities and a couple of good points and a couple of terrible points and charges that I don't know whether he can refute or not and it's all without any context or idea at all. Therefore I have a clue even as a description of him, let alone what is essential. But once you meet the five you know everything there is to know about these characters. If, if the characterization is properly given, <clears throat> as it is by a romantic novel. So I want to pick 
a non-obvious character, not a rock. I want to pick Dominique and ask what is the essence of Dominique? Now, of course, you're asking them, what distinguishes her? Well, the first question is, distinguishes her from whom? Well, let's start with the easiest. What distinguishes her from Rourke? Which I think is the easiest to start with. You could start anywhere, but you'll get to, to contrast an error with somebody who's correct is easier. And then you can contrast the error with other types of error. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I'll start by asking how would I distinguish Dominique from Rourke? Well, of course, there's a lot of things that occur to you. She's female, he's male. <laughs> but that's not relevant here. Those have to be discarded because we're concerned with her character. Now, if I was a Marxist, I would have to say, well, <clears throat> he's poor and she's rich. So that makes the difference with her character. But I discard that as not essential because I don't hold that type of view. Or he's an architect and she's a journalist. All that is out. All those are the superficial uh, uh, type of things that you get rid of at the very beginning. We're interested in their <coughs> character, their thoughts, their ideas, their, their life attitude. <coughs> well, <coughs> at this point, I just made a list as of what occurred to me within the context of their attitudes, the differences, because I'm trying to differentiate Dominique from Rourke. So this is the list exactly as it came. Rourke works. Dominique has no real career. Now that's certainly relevant. It's not yet a statement of the essential, but it's, it's a fact that is going to be relevant. Rourke builds. Dominique tears down. Well, she tears down in order. Uh, she tries to defeat him. She's afraid. Of, of what's going to happen to the things he built. Rourke doesn't notice people. Dominique, I remember to me, they can't bear the idea that he's in the elevator with somebody else. That somebody else's eyes are looking at him. She feels something about people is bad and, and she can't stand it. <clears throat> but there are big issues. Rourke creates objects of beauty. I'm saying the same thing from different angles, you see. Dominique sees this beautiful statue and throws it down the air shaft. Uh, Rourke loves her. She loves him and marries his enemies. Now, <clears throat> I try to abstract now. Keeping all that data, there's a lot more if you wanted to go into detail in mind. What is the common denominator? of one side versus the other. The fundamental that unites them all. It obviously has something to do with their attitude to values. They have two opposite attitudes to values. Rourke's attitude is, I can get what I want. It's worth struggling. People can affect it. The universe is, in Ms. Rand's terms, Bad ever. And Dominic's attitude is, it's impossible to achieve uh, uh, the good. All you'll do is desecrate it. If you try, people hold some terrible power to, to, to stop you. The universe is not level. Okay, now we've reached that much. Well, can we say then, the essence of Dominic is that she is a malevolent, a malevolent universal. Well, yes and no. <clears throat> malevolent universal does not capture Dominique yet. It's part of what's essential to her, but it's not the whole answer. Because we can think of characters that are radically different from Dominique, but who share the same broad abstraction that they are malevolent universe. Who else in the novel? represents or in, 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 illustrates the malevolent universe besides Dominique? Tui, certainly. And Wynan and even Keating. <clears throat> they are all malevolent. Now who should we try to distinguish Dominique from in order to get at the key to her? Now before you tell me, 
<clears throat> let me give you this general rule of guidance. When you want to distinguish classified man, you don't call him the rational soul, right? You want to put him in the category that's closest to him and then differentiate within that. So you keep all of your knowledge about him going. And you don't get thrown off into, well, he's a solid, therefore his essence is that he's not full of hot air. <laughs> so when you want to differentiate, you differentiate from the character that's the closest, not from the one that's the farthest. Now, we did that with Rourke in one way, because they both have this passion and attitude toward values, and that was the common denominator. But now I'm keeping two in wine, and which is the closest to dominant? Wine. 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 So we have to differentiate now. Dominate from wine, and then when we do that, we will come up with the essence of the character. Now, here again, I just made myself a list of obvious points. Wine is after power. Dominate wants independence, but through solitude, aloofness. Wynan has a driving purpose, a career which uh, is a passion to him. Dominate does not. Wynan tries to break men of genius, great individuals. Dominique thinks it's awful, but she tries to defeat Rourke in her own way. Wynan ends up defeated and broken. Dominique ends up converted and saved. Now, what is the difference then? They're both malevolent universes. They both believe that values, the good, has no chance in uh, an evil world. But they come to two different conclusions on that base. She comes to the conclusion, well then you can't succeed, you may as well not try. Withdraw, flee from others, despise them, and just be paralyzed. And he comes to the conclusion, yes, you can succeed in this kind of world, if what? If you conquer those who have the evil power. If you can rule them, then the universe is free again for you to achieve your values. And therefore, he tries to conquer others, to do which, of course, he has to accept their terms, put out newspapers and please them. Uh, he has to try to beat them at their <coughs> own game. <coughs> and anytime he sees an authentic individualist who is not after power, he has to prove that that person is a fake. There can't be such a person because then his own metaphysics is wrong if you could succeed uh, by that means. So they each have the malevolent universe, but you could put it this way. <coughs> they represent two opposite sides of the mind-body dichotomy within the malevolent universe. Wine is the body or the practical side. He knows what he's doing is not right, not good, <coughs> not noble, but his attitude is nobility is a myth. <coughs> there is no such thing. In this world, you have to be realistic. So he's like the practical side. And Dominique is the soul or mind side of the, of, or the moral side of the dichotomy. And her life is actually total renunciation, just like the medieval uh, saints. And she said, she says uh, she's going to do what's right, and what's right is to protect the good, and to protect the good you don't create it, or try to get rid of it when it's created, because it's going to be murderously destroyed even worse later. So she carries out morality as she sees it to the extreme, and he carries out practicality. Both of those based on a malevolent universe definition. And that's why Wyden takes actions in reality which are evil. And therefore, in the logic of his life course, he's going to have to be defeated and lose. Whereas Dominic's flaws are only in default. What she has not yet done or achieved with her life, and that's why there's still a chance for her in reality to be saved when she gets enough evidence to put the case together. So I would say, on this basis, the essence of Dominique is she is an idealistic malevolent universe. And that contrasted with Rourke and with Wynan. And of course, by this point, you know obviously that she's not Keating, because Keating has no ideals, he's just a secondhand cipher. And he's certainly contrasted with Tui, who not only has no ideals, his ideal is to destroy ideals. He's an anti idealist, which is much worse than anybody else uh, in the book. Now, 
I don't know if you find this self-evident or helpful or what, but I thought when, we, when I first worked it out that it's helpful because it gives you a simplified pattern. In a case where you know all of the concretes, the method, by which to pin down what is the essence of a character. And that method is continuous differentiation and then abstraction of the fundamental. And then further differentiation and abstraction until you feel all the data in front of you, or all the data that's relevant, is explained and in, in intelligent. And at that point, you have the essence of a character. Now, it's much harder to do on a real person because a, a proper author gives you only significant details. But a person gives you everything. He's just, you know, what he likes for breakfast is thrown on the table along with everything else. So you have to do an infinite amount of discarding uh, on a real person relative to a character before you get to the essential because you're drawn with so many details. So you have to constantly be on the lookout for does this count or not? And usually you have three categories. I dismiss this. This is obviously significant, like if he picks up the butcher knife. And <laughs> such and such, I don't know, I'll put that on hold. I don't know what it means that he keeps scratching his, his ear and sticking his tongue out, or whatever that means. <laughs> now, if you don't mind a one minute uh, autobiographical comment, um, I'll tell you what I would do on myself in relation to uh, my history, at least, in relation to Dominique. And it's interesting because when I read the novel as a teenager, I was most personally identified with Dominique. Uh, I, she was the character that I uh, sympathized with and was most uh, felt closest to and most wanted to know what happened uh, to her. So did I have the same essence as her? Well, yes and no. I certainly was an idealist and I certainly was a malevolent universe as a teenager. So in that two respects, I was exactly like Dominique. But I had one difference that I didn't like about her, or not that I didn't like because I, I understood, but that I couldn't square with what I wanted. I thought productiveness was an enormous value, extremely important, and I couldn't imagine the idea of just standing by saying everything is awful. Uh, and of course, I couldn't sympathize with uh, Wyand's idea of power. So I figured out my own way out of this uh, dilemma, which was find a productive field that is immune to the evil of the world, where you can be fully productive and they can't get you or destroy you. And that to me was the world of philosophy. <laughs> no, but that, that's true, that's uh, the tragic truth, that's what attracted me to philosophy. That, of course I was interested in the questions and I was intelligent, but this is what set the seal was, this was a world where you could pursue truth apart from the reality which is ruled by evil. Now of course that very uh, motivation being mixed, broad mixed consequences. I learned a lot of good things but I fell completely into the trap of rationalism. I was completely right for that because philosophy to me was this world that you thought about Detached from the real world, so that you know, I started thinking by deduction from one idea to the other to the other. And then, of course, it came as a revelation to me that this was all wrong. But you see, the motive from which you choose a field right away starts corrupting the knowledge of the field. But then the happy ending is because I chose the field of philosophy with emphasis on epistemology and had Ayn Rand as a teacher, the field finally became self correcting for me. It corrected its own error by teaching me the right epistemology after which I could get rid of rationalism and then come back to reality and start over from scratch. Uh, but that's part of the reason why it took me 40 years. It shouldn't, shouldn't take you that long. But I'm simply saying, from the point of view of defining in terms of essentials, that, that little crazy that I gave of my life, I think captures my development in essentials. And it does so by, again, the same method, differentiating me from Dominique Amwine and then trying to see what is the combination. And I really had a direct contradiction as the combination. Ideals and work and malevolence. And so I was forced into a certain path uh, as a result of it. Now, I'm, I'm not boasting about that, obviously, but I'm not ashamed of it either because I did the best I could and I've proven that by the rest of my life. So uh, you can take that for what it's worth. Now, there's a couple other topics that I wanted to cover here. 
uh, that one is on the brochure. And that is how to translate from English to essentials. In other words, from ordinary language to essentials. Now, I don't mean that you should always, every time you hear a sentence, rewrite it as it would be if you had your essentialized spectacles on and you were looking just for the S. Sometimes, many times, there's no point in that. You know, if uh, you say, I'd like orange juice, you don't have to say, <laughs> nutrition is essential to survival, you know. Uh, but sometimes it's helpful to take a point when you're thinking about it, ask yourself, what is the essential statement of this idea? And I've just jotted down a few here out of an endless number, just to give you the indication of it. Here's a true, true statement in non-essential form. Competition keeps prices down. That's a statement I've begun on. Now that's fine. But if that's all you know, or all the legislators know, and they want to keep prices down and they want to increase competition, what is that uh, like an invitation to? Let's have no either, or price controls, but more likely, let's have antitrust legislation to make sure we have lots of competition. That's how the Republicans in 1890 fought, basically. They saw competition as good because it keeps prices down, so let's have more competition. Now, if they saw that same statement in essentialized terms, I want you to give me a three-word sentence which will tell you what the essence of competition is in this context. Is it competition among power lusters? Is it competition among what? Among what kind of person? Producers. 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 Well, is producer anybody who works anywhere in the world? Uh, uh, it's competition among people who are left free to produce, right? So then what the essence of that condition is? Competition, the essence there that keeps the price down is the freedom that underlies and makes possible the kind of production that makes possible the kind of competition that keeps prices down. And what is, the free, what is another name, a deeper name for keeping prices down? which also includes more goods are available, less effort is required to get them, etc. No, no, that's the system. But what is it? the stuff called that you buy at lower prices and get more of? Well, so competition keeps prices down. Essentialized translates into freedom promotes wealth. Now, you don't have to do that all the time. There are times when it's important to focus on competition. But you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to see that prices is not just a mechanism for adjusting supply and demand. That's We're talking about wealth. And you have to see that competition is not just some you know economic interrelationship. It's an aspect of freedom. Now, here I'm going to give you another one. And I want you to translate this. This happens to be a false statement, but I want you to translate it into what it's really saying. Religion makes life exciting. <laughs> oh, that's very common. You, you must have heard that in one form or another. We have this humdrum, prosaic world where everything is, uh, you know, figured out and scientific and so on, whereas religion gives us a whole you know, a whole exciting new uh, dimension of the unexpected, the unpredictable, the older guys, everything. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what would be an essentialized restatement uh, of that? Now, you, you can think, obviously, there must be something wrong with that because Russian roulette makes life exciting. <laughs> as long as it laughs. <laughs> what does a person mean by exciting in this context? He obviously doesn't mean a cheap thrill. He means what? Interesting. It introduces the arbitrary? No, no. What does this person mean? You're giving me the, uh, the, uh, your cr critique of it, but I want to know what would he mean by exciting when you press it down? It doesn't, it doesn't mean it on a serious level just the, the thrill of uh, some momentary excitement. It's the idea that makes life important. It makes it meaningful. It makes it what? Motivation by fear? 
No, you're giving me, you're answering my criticism. I'm not trying to criticize. I'm just trying to translate. I'm not trying to say what's wrong with this statement. I want to say, what is he trying to get at when he says religion makes life exciting? What is the deepest, most essential term for what he is putting in popular terminology as excitement or meaningfulness or significance or importance? Fulfillment. Purpose. What? Purpose. Purpose or even more broadly, values. His idea is uh, uh, religion provides life with values in the significant sense, you know, not just crude material values, but real values. That's, that's the meaning uh, of exciting. And now what, is, what does he mean by religion? What is religion in its essence? In its essence, not necessarily in his statement, but in its essence. Philosophy. No, religion is a type of philosophy. What type of philosophy? A philosophy that rejects reason, that's essentially based on faith. So religion makes life exciting. Translate that into its essence, and it would be reason is incompatible with values. <coughs> now, if you think of it in those terms, you have a much better context to know what to do with it. <laughs> Now, I'll give you one more. A humility in ideological matters makes social existence safe and secure. You know the idea that if everybody went around saying they have the, the, the real answers, everybody would be a dictator and try to force the answers down everybody else's throat. This is the standard liberal line. But if we're all humble, we realize we don't know the answers, nobody has the answers, then we can get along together perfectly well. We each have our own opinion, but nobody tries to force Others, and so we have a tranquil, safe, and secure life. Now, this is a, a, a bromide. Uh, they don't always use the word humility, but sometimes they do. Humility in ideological matters makes social existence tranquil, safe, secure. Now, what does that translate into in essentialized? Humility in ideological matters really is what? Yes. Skepticism. Skepticism, the inability to know. Ignorance, right? And what is a tranquil or social existence? What would be the alternative to it? Where we're, you know, enslaved and wrecked and destroyed and can't go on. So what this is really saying is ignorance is an essential of survival. <laughs> or put another way, the choice in life is cognition or survival. <laughs> now, if anybody came out with that, he'd be laughed off the floor. And yet, that's what it means, and there's thousands of editorials. But they get away with it by not putting it in essentialized terms. So what you should try to do where it's appropriate is try to find, um, ex uh, look through the essence. That's why Ayn Rand has such a terrific mind one of the things she did is whenever it was appropriate, she could translate, you would say X, and she would say, in other words, Y, and your reaction would be, oh, no, I don't mean, well, maybe I did. You see? <laughs> and you find out that that's what you meant, you didn't have a clue that that's what you meant, but she could take that right away and translate into the essential. Now, that is a skill uh, that can be acquired, but it takes a lot of practice and takes a lot of, I would say, personal tutoring from somebody who can keep catching you decade after decade <laughs> until finally you hit them all. Uh, and now I've got only about 10 minutes and I had one other thing I wanted to do. But uh, I think I'm going to give you a question period instead. What I was going to do you can have me do this tomorrow in the question period if you want. Let's tell you how, if I were, as I am, in charge of a, uh, signing a contract to do a movie of Atlas Shrug, what, how I would determine what aspects of the production it is essential that I control and which not. And I actually have that worked out here as part of this course, but I, I think I'll save it to you get some questions, and if anybody's interested in that, <laughs> you can ask me <laughs> tomorrow. So we'll take questions now. We have about uh, eight or nine minutes. Yeah.
In your example on nihilism, is it sufficient just to go down to it as far as identifying that all these things are, are nihilistic? Uh, don't you need to go down and find the cause of nihilism? Uh, you know, the question is, is it sufficient to just abstract that what's common to all these examples in the, is nihilism in the Weimar culture case? Don't you have to also go to what underlies and what is this basic philosophic cause? My answer that, to that is it's all contextual. It entirely depends on what you know. Suppose you are just, you know, you're not starting out with a knowledge of Kant and a knowledge of objectivism. You're just plunged, you know, into this culture. And you see that it has differences from the things that you saw when you were a child. If you could get to the point of saying nihilism, you would, even if you had no idea why, you would have some tremendous advantages. First of all, you would have made sense within your own context. What is going on? And then you would have made precise what exactly you want to know. Where could nihilism come from? What could lead to it on this broader scale? And then you'd have to investigate and say, what kind of subject you know, could affect the whole philosophy? It can't just be music or science or you know, math or whichever. And then you would encounter the subject of philosophy. There must be something in here you know, in, that is able to be so all pervasive. Well, what could possibly lead to that? Well, when did it start? And you see it started in the late 19th century. And who was the dominant influence and what did he teach? And you know, little by little, you would, if you, you know, pursued it and, and you agree on top of it, you would get down to what type of basic philosophy leads to the hatred of values and therefore to nihilism across the culture. But you couldn't say, as you imply in your question, you must do this. Because you can't say must where it's impossible. You can only go as far as you can go. At any point, you say, this is the common denominator of the cause I don't know at this point. But within my context, something has to produce this, and I'll keep looking, you see. So it's nice to be able to integrate it with all the rest. But if you can't, you keep it hanging there with the idea, I know this much, and I'm very eager to integrate, but I don't know what to yet, so I'm looking around. That's just exactly like Rourke with the D. You know, at the beginning where uh, he saw something's the matter with the D, he doesn't function the way I do it. He couldn't, why? He couldn't put his finger on it. Well, he couldn't integrate it, but he didn't therefore throw it out or make up a false explanation. He left it specifically as not yet understood, wait for more information. You know, and then he, he put it all together. So uh, that's how it, I would answer that. Yes? Where in 1992, can we find the private tutoring one-tenth, one-tenth, one-thirtieth of what you had with Ayn Rand? Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't know any answer to that question. Is where in 1992 can you get the private tutoring one-tenth or one-thirtieth that I got from Ayn Rand? Uh, I wish I knew. Certainly not from me. Neither said own I wouldn't make comparisons uh, of myself to her. But uh, I don't do it anyway. So um, you have to, I, what I would suggest is that you contact uh, Dr. Berliner of the Ayn Rand Institute, who knows all uh, the experts in objectivism. Several are in this room, and they could certainly make a terrific start. And I don't want to cause any ill feeling by singling out any one uh, person. But uh, if you're interested, I think that is available. But. Uh, on a commercial basis. Okay, yes, Gary. When you were comparing some of the traits of wine to Dominique, yeah. I, would have, I would have taken his art gallery as an indication of, of a strong stream of idealism. Now, what's, obviously I'm making some mistake there. No, I didn't make a mistake. That's a good question. Uh, Gary says if he was making a list, he would have put down Wine is art gallery as an example of a strong streak of idealism in him. And isn't that a mistake on his part? No, certainly not. And I could counter that with Dominique. She was, which did she just live in a, in a desert island and bemoan the fate of the world? Despite her view, she was taking action all the time. 
She was writing columns. She was denouncing these people. She was, you know, she was trying to protect Roar in, in all the practical ways she could, at the same time trying to destroy him. So she certainly, the reason you're interested in her in a character is because she's such a decisive actor. And yet her philosophy is action is useless. And the reason you can sympathize with Wynan is, is because he is such an idealist, despite the fact that he disavows idealism. So what you have to say is, these are both people who have a true mind-body dichotomy. And to have that, you can't have it 100%. So the better part of them pushes them into the other side of it, you know, uh, by necessity. If you were purely the powerless, you'd have to be like Tui or Hitler. Uh, it wouldn't be whining. And if you were purely, you know, the, the, the woman who sits back and observes the passing folly, that would be Ivy Starnes in uh, uh, Adler Shard. It wouldn't be Dominic. So you have to take into account the context that these are two people who are essentially honest. And being essentially honest, they cannot escape the other part of the dichotomy, so they're caught in a contradiction. Uh, but that still doesn't mean there isn't a difference in their emphasis and on the, the path they try to fall. See, the, I, I took that for granted. But if I wrote it, I think you're making a correct amendment. I'd have to say, I have to put down to begin with, I'm distinguishing the honest characters from the dishonest ones. And then I would have Roar, Dominique, and Wynan, who I believe was honest, you see. Do you understand my answer, therefore, has two parts? That plus the issue that you cannot really specialize completely, so you have to contradict yourself. But if you have any virtue, that virtue will make you take the good elements of the other side to some extent somewhere. So would you right to say that this is one of the reasons you would, you would compare her to him in the first place versus her to Ivy Star. Oh, absolutely. That's why I th he's the closest to her because they're both good characters. And she says in the book somewhere, she has the strange feeling they've committed the same treason. She says to Wyman. So the author is obviously pointing out to you you're supposed to draw a message or draw a moral here, but you know a lot of people don't. Uh, a lot of people think Wyman is dishonest, which is absolutely not uh, Ayn Rand's intention. In fact, she, she told me once that the only time on the whole fountainhead that she ever cried while she was writing was in Rourke's final farewell uh, to Wyman, that she was crying as she was writing it because uh, she had such great admiration for Wyman as a character and she thought his mistake was so tragic. So he was certainly in no sense intended to come across as an evil character. In fact, when the, when the time came to do his worst, then to break Rourke, he couldn't do it. He tried and he simply was disarmed. He was unable to do it. And that showed, you see, that he had, he had virtue to the point that even having lived the life he did, and the respect for value took over. Uh, and that's what, what basically redeemed him, but it was too late. Well, with that, we are now exactly two and a half minutes over. So I uh, thank you very much, and I'll see you tomorrow.